Ooh, it's bufferings. There we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tess Gallagher. I am a recent master's uh, paleobiology graduate from the University of Bristol. And my specialty lies in uh, diplodica skin, uh, everything from their the taphonomy to physiology, how they looked, et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, let's see. We can uh, share a screen. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, so today I'm going to be telling you guys how to properly skin your diplodocids, as well as some uh, general myths and paleo memes about sauropod integument. So, firstly, usually whenever we think about sauropods, uh, you might think of diplodocids as being really wrinkly, like an elephant, or maybe you think of diplodocids like the classic walking with dinosaurs diplodocus, which has these like iconic row of spines going down the back. Uh, unfortunately, so both this elephant looking uh, depiction of Diplodocids and sadly the walking with dinosaur Diplodocus are inaccurate. I know it's very sad. I love walking with dinosaurs Diplodocus, but it is not uh, accurate anymore. So what do we know? So what I'm mainly talking about here today is skin that comes from a site called the Mother's Day Quarry. And this quarry has a bunch of juvenile Diplodocus that all died together, then got swept up by something called a debris flow, uh, and then uh, are now fossilized where they are today. And this site is really amazing because we get a lot of Diplodocus skin there. So what's really interesting is you can probably see from this skin map that I made, uh, this is only one individual that we're looking at here this isn't a composite of all the skin that we have this is just one individual and you can see how much variety there is in these scales so i'm going to go over all these different types of scales where they are what they could mean and how you might interpret them so first off we have polygonal scales which are the most common scales in dinosaurs period you see these in sauropods you see these in uh theropods, ornithischians, you even see these in modern day birds on their feet, technically. Uh, but what's really interesting about the polygonal scales and sauropods is that they have these little bumps on them, right? So you can see they, it looks like these got these little uh, scales inside the big scales. So these aren't actually little scales. These are called papillae. So they're epidermal papillae. And these little bumps were probably present in life. Now, they were probably used for something related to thermoregulation. Maybe they could have held onto water, similar to how elephant wrinkles work. Um, but these bumps are found on all sauropod scales. Um, or sorry, not all scales, but uh, on all sauropods, I should say. So I have like four images here, and these are all from both uh, diplodocoids and macronarians. There's Camarasaurus, uh, Tehelchosaurus, Diplodocus and Apatosaur are shown here. Uh, so if this is something you want to try in detail in your sauropod drawings, you can certainly do that. I personally have never tried to illustrate these because I already have to draw individual scales. I, I don't know how I feel about drawing individual details in individual scales, but they are cool nonetheless. Uh, so the arms are really interesting. We have this one piece of Diplodocus skin where we see these rectangular scales interrupt this pattern patterning of polygonal scales, and they seem to turn downwards, right? We got this weird angled look to them. And these look really, really similar to how scales look in modern reptiles, uh, specifically the ones that go around limbs, and they look strikingly similar to what we see specifically in crocodilians. So around it, probably the front leg of Diplodocus and other Diplodocids, uh, they probably had these scales that were going around the limb, probably for the purpose of uh, to give it some flexibility and to allow for natural wrinkling. Uh, but this is a feature that I would not be surprised was in other dinosaurs too. 
Now we have the rectangular scales, which are kind of interesting. These are also sort of common in dinosaurs. We have them in things like Triceratops. But in Diplodocus, they're in this really weird position where they seem to be in the middle of the abdomen. Like you just have polygonal scales, rectangular scales, more political, polygonal scales. <laughs> um, so they're kind of weirdly placed. And usually I've just interpreted that maybe these look like a line going across the abdomen, which is how this was depicted in this model that you can now see in Zurich. As you can see, the you have these uh, rectangular scales that are just kind of in the middle of the abdomen. Why were they like that? I'm not really sure. Uh, but yeah, so we also have these really weird, weird, weird scales that are globular scales uh, that kind of look like jelly beans sometimes. And these are really cool because there's, as far as I'm concerned, there are no modern scales that look like these. Now, of course, who knows? Maybe someone's going to discover some obscure, obscure gecko or lizard that has these scales. But as far as I can tell, they, I haven't seen these before in anything living today. So these were probably on the shoulder and they were quite large and uh, prominent, or at least, you know, compared to the animal. So... Uh, I know that some people have interpreted these as maybe being some sort of, uh, like, armor on the shoulder, which is actually what the PNSO Ling Wulong uh, figure depicted these as. As you can see, it has these, like, big scales on the sh shoulder. Um, maybe they could have been like that, maybe not. We're not really sure. Uh, but they certainly are a very odd and interesting feature. So... Um, now we're going to jump a little bit into some of these memes. Uh, paleo memes, as I should say. Paleo memes are, as, as some of you probably already know, a paleo meme is something that is repeated again and again and again in paleo art, uh, despite there not being much evidence for such feature. And... Some of you may be surprised to see that these spines are kind of a really weird example of a paleo meme, and I call them a hidden paleo meme. So why do I refer to these as like a hidden paleo meme? Well, first off, uh, so usually people think that these spines are all just the same shape, right? But they're not. So these spines are very, very fragmentary, but from the little that we have, we can tell that there is definitely some diversity in their shape going on. So it's not just this all the same shape like you see in an iguana. There is definitely going to be some variety going on here. But also, biggest reason why I call these a hidden paleo meme is because it seems like people have just... They just assume that we absolutely know that Diplodocus had these. The truth is, there has been no direct evidence that Diplodocus ever had these spines. So, these spines originate from Hal Quarry, which is uh, a quarry that is in uh, the Morrison Formation. So, same place as Diplodocus. But the sauropods that were present there are Catadocus and Barosaurus, which are both close relatives of Diplodocus. Um... But obviously, they're not Diplodocus. So, is there a chance that Diplodocus could have had structures like this? Well, we do have these really weird-looking uh, ovoid scales, which are personally a pain to take pictures of, because whenever you see these things in person, they're, like, so prominent. It's like, holy crap, those are dinosaur scales. And then you try to take a picture of them, and then they disappear. It's so frustrating. But, you know, here I have an illustration to hopefully show you guys what these things look like. And they are these raised ovoid-shaped scales that are really closely clustered together and seem to be on the dorsal side. Now, there is something weird going on with these that, to me, suggests they may have been slowly growing in as these uh, juveniles were growing. Um, so, as you can see, there's like these dome scales right in front of these ovoid scales. And I was speculating maybe those were would eventually grow into ovoid scales and go all along the back, and maybe these would turn into spines. Uh, 
But of course, if they did turn into spines, that doesn't mean that they would just be a singular row of spines going down the back. These could have been a whole cluster of big spines on the back, or maybe a big spine in the middle and smaller spines on the side. Or even potentially, these may have never even grown into spines to begin with. It's uh, just as plausible that these may have just stayed as these ovoid shapes even in adulthood. So, of course, then you might be saying, but phylogenetic bracketing, shouldn't we just assume Diplodocus had this because Barosaurus and Catadoccus are close relatives of Diplodocus? Well, the thing with phylogenetic bracketing is that it really isn't that simple. Um... I think one of the best examples of how phylogenetic bracketing uh, can be troublesome is like when we look at old depictions of Spinosaurus and how we just assumed it was going to have big long legs and now it has super short legs. Um, but for in, in terms of skin, right? So here we have Sorolophus, which is a hadrosaur, and there are two different species of Sorolophus, right? And we have skin from both of these species, specifically uh, from their tails. And what's interesting is that the scale patterns on their tails uh, are different between the two species. So one has scales that are patterned in like a circular patterning, and then the other one have uh, scales that are stripes, right? So now we need to look at this and say, okay, these are two completely different species, and their integument uh, is pretty different from one another, right? So if two different species of dinosaurs can have such differences in their integument, what about two different genus, or two different families, or clades, right? So when it comes to spines, I highly, highly encourage people to be more variable with them. Uh, instead of just doing a singular row of spines down the back, play around with them a little bit. Go nuts. Go crazy. Uh, you could do lots of weird things with them. Now, some of you are probably looking at all these scales that I just told you about, these bajillion million scales, and you're probably saying, okay, but why should we even care about drawing these? Because aren't these going to be too small to see anyway? So I don't know where this myth originates from. I'm guessing it was either hadrosaurs or probably T-Rex, but there's this idea that all dinosaur scales are super small, and the only way you could see them is if you're standing right next to them. And I'm going to tell you right now, with sauropods and diplodocus and diplodocids, it, that's not true. Um, here's a very beautiful specimen from Mother's Day that has these uh, ovoid scales and rectangular scales right next to each other. So these are the ovoid scales, and then these are the flat rectangular scales. You can just see, like, these are very, very visible. And also, I, just, I do want to take a moment to appreciate, like, how cool this specimen is. When you see this thing, you don't think to yourself, like, you know, wrinkly or, like, oh, I really have to squint to see these scales. You see this, and you're like, holy crap, that is a, like, reptilian skin, right? That is a scaly creature right there. And, you know, the thing you have to keep in mind, this is from a juvenile, right? We don't know how big this juvenile is, though, if I were to guess, maybe anywhere between as big as a cow to as big as a rhinoceros, right? But definitely not from a fully grown individual. So we do have scales from at least fully grown uh, diplodocids and sauropods, uh, specifically those polygonal scales I was telling you guys about. And from what we can tell, those polygonal scales, so they get to be about three centimeters, right, in uh, diameter. Now you might hear that and think, that's not big. But when you actually see them in person, it's like, holy crap, no, that that's pretty visible, right? So this is a picture of me at the Natural History Museum in London, and they have this diplodocus leg uh, that has these polygonal scales on it that are all accurate to size. And just by looking at this picture, those scales are pretty in your face, right? You don't have to be standing right next to this leg just to see them. I mean, you could see these across the hall. So now you also have to take into consideration, like, okay, these are just polygonal scales that we have here, right? And it's very likely that the adult diplodocans and diplodocus would have had all these other scale textures that I just told you about. 
And these could have been bigger or smaller or flatter or rounder compared to these polygonal scales. And when you combine all of these things together, you're not getting an animal that looks wrinkly or simple in texture. This is a very textured animal that would be very, very reptilian uh, and probably very surprising to look at. Um, okay. <laughs> Feathers? No. Um, but let me explain. So, we have not found any... <laughs> I'm sorry. But we have not found any direct evidence that sauropods had feathers. Um, now, about feathers. So, it's not necessarily the case that they couldn't have evolved feathers. Feathers are in all other groups of dinosaurs, right? We have them in ornithischians, we got them in theropods, and depending on who you ask, we have them in pterosaurs too, right? Which aren't dinosaurs. Um, so it wouldn't be that surprising if sauropods could have feathers. Maybe their earliest ancestor did. But you have to ask yourself, would they need them, right? What could feathers do for sauropods that their scales can't already do already? So one of the main things why sauropods might have feathers, of course, that's not to say that maybe they could have had like a eyelashes or maybe like a little like doohickey, like a display feather on their head or something, but they're, they're definitely not going to be covered in them. So some people might think back to like elephant hair, right? This is something that you, is pretty common for people to depict any big dinosaur with in paleo art. Uh, so you might ask, but what about these? So in elephants, these hairs are used for thermoregulation. They help to increase surface area and natural convection so that these guys can shed more heat, right? Um, but the question is, right, Diplodocus has so many variable scale shapes going on, and you have to ask yourself, why would Diplodocus have something like this when instead it could be doing something with its scales that would probably be far more efficient than these hairs, right? So that's kind of why I don't think they had feathers. Of course, like I said earlier, maybe they had some weird display feather or eyelashes, or maybe there is a secret tiny arctic sauropod that needed feathers. Who knows? Who knows? But so far, there's there's really no evidence for it. So I'm going to very briefly talk about color. Sorry, Some of you may just, know that yeah, I... Keep, keep it short, yeah, because yeah. we are we don't have that much time. time. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Well, then super quick about colors. Oh, well. Anyway, colors are really, really complicated. And I'm just here to say you don't have to make your sauropods gray. Basically, all I'm going to say here, uh, when you're trying to figure out color, it's not all about the melanin. Usually melanin is all we find in the fossils. And... That is not the only thing that contributes to color. You have cells called chromatophores that can come in a variety of different kinds, and they will uh, they they are responsible for creating all sorts of colors, such as what you see in chameleons, right? These things don't preserve. So without these, we can't really tell the exact color of dinosaurs. And this is just something in general to keep in mind with any scaly dinosaurs, specifically scaly dinosaurs. Feathers are a little different, but scaly dinosaurs, it's a more complicated story, and long story short, you don't have to make your sauropods gray. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> oh, that was... Oh, I, I thought you still had a few... Yeah. Oh, pretty good on time. 